great to be here in person. I think this is the first talk I've done in person for a couple of years. Um, so State of the Union, how are we doing? Well, the State of the Union is strong, as they say. It's a great year for RISC-5. This is really another milestone year. Um, we ratified a whole bunch of extensions. So 15 extensions are getting ratified this year. Um, and I think another thing to, you know, people always ask, when is RISC-5 going to happen? What's well, happening? You know, we have billions of cores shipped in production parts this year, 2021, right? There's a lot of RISC-V cores out there. Um, as Jan Sub told you in his keynote, RISC-V has no limits. People often want to say, well, RISC-V is just for this or just for that. But as we built it out, there's really no reason why it can't go everywhere in all the different domains there are. And, you know, this is, I think Dave Patterson coined this, you know, RISC-V is inevitable. I think we used to joke about taking over the whole industry. And now it's like, yeah, well, obviously it's going to take over the whole industry. Um, it's such a good idea. I think most people see this is how things should be done at the instruction set level. So um, the thing to say is, you know, this community has been great at building out this whole ecosystem. So it's not just one company, organization, group of people. Everybody's contributed to this. And now we have this very um, thriving, growing ecosystem. And RISC-5 International is at the core of this. RISC-5 International is the standards organization, a nonprofit organization that manages the specs, produces new specifications with input from everybody in the membership. And this really acts as the interface between software and hardware. So on the hardware side, um, a lot of you have seen this slide before, but I know there's a lot of new people here. Um, to understand, RISC-V is not an open source ISA. RISC-V is an open specification, and because it's open, it means you can have open source ISAs. Uh, open source implementations. We have many implementations of RISC-V, but it's not only open source, we also have all the commercial cores. And I keep having to reduce my font size on this slide as we get more and more core providers. Um, in addition, there's all the in-house cores from various companies, so you can build your own core. So one thing I'll say is we kind of need a new analog to Moore's law, because I think the number of RISC-V cores available every year seems to be about doubling. We're losing track of how many cores are out there, free cores, commercial cores, in-house cores. So there's a proliferation of RISC-V hardware. And the great thing about this ecosystem, those people developing the hardware don't have to develop all the software because there's a, a very rich and growing software ecosystem that's both on the open source side where we have all the mainstream um, uh, software packages are supporting RISC-V, but also commercially, there's commercially supported software vendors are supporting RISC-V also for the projects. So again, RISC-V is an open standard, it enables both open source and commercial proprietary implementations of both hardware and software. So this great rich ecosystem that continues to grow very rapidly. Now, I think engineers get fixated on, well, is this core a little bit faster than that one? What's the area? What's the power of? And they kind of lose track of why RISC-V is important. Like it's really about the business model. So on this slide, I kind of want to lay out what the real differences are between the instruction sets. And it's not about how they do add or how many, what the addressing mode is on a load. That is not the key difference, right? Those are all tiny details in the grand scheme of things. The real difference is in how you can use those instruction sets, right? So x86, you can buy chips from a few people, but only those people, nobody else. Can you get an architectural license to build your own x86 core? No. Are the commercial soft core providers of x86? No. Can you add your own instructions to x86? Unless you're Intel AMD or maybe VIA? No. Is there open source IP? Hell no, right? No, you cannot get that from x86. ARM, um, can you get chips? Yes, you can get it from many vendors. Can you get an architectural license to design your own course? Yes, but it's kind of expensive. Can you get commercial IP? Yes, it's commercially licensable IP, but only from one vendor, okay? Can you add your own instructions? Not really, in a few cases, yes, but mostly no. Um, open source IP? No, okay. RISC-5, can you get chips? Yes, an increasing number of chips are available for many people have RISC-V cores on them. Architecture license, well, kind of everybody gets one for free. You know, the spec is there, you can go build your cores to that spec. Nobody's gonna ask you to pay for that. Um, commercial core IP, yes, many, many vendors. So RISC-V, as we saw in the previous slide, there's more commercial IP providers giving you, you know, license cores, you have to pay for them, but they're supported, uh, guaranteed, the companies stand behind you with support. There's more vendors now than any other ISA ever in history, right? That number keeps growing. All around the world, there are organizations, companies doing this. 
Um, can you add your own instructions? Yes, you don't need to add permission. And open source IP, yes, there's many, many available. So this is a slide I've used before, but as I was staring at this slide, getting ready for the, the set of slides for today's talk, kind of struck me about the obvious observation to make here is, you know, risk five, it's the ISA that likes to say yes. So if any of you grew up in the 80s, you'll know which advertising uh, program I stole this tagline from. But basically, risk five is the ISA that likes to say yes. You can do all these things with risk five. Now, saying yes has its own, brings its own issues. So managing success. So what we see with risk five is demand for risk five everywhere. Every possible process of socket, people looking for risk five to go in that socket. And they want every performance level from what I call from low to ludicrous, you know, in terms of core performance. There's demand across the spectrum. And, you know, if there has ever been a feature in any ISA, people expect every feature of every ISA ever done to be somehow crammed into the risk five ecosystem. Um, but we have some real world constraints uh, in managing this, uh, this growth and demand. Um, one big one is on the software side, right? And I just alluded, we've sort of been managing this, so you'll see some other talks. Um, we're working on simplifying the combinations of choices in certain key common areas, so profiles and platforms. I'll talk a little bit about more of those later. Um, but also, we have to start thinking about risk five actually is gonna to have to change a little bit how the tool chains work. Now, this is a new thing. The tool chain is gonna to have to adapt a little and accommodate the variety of flexibility risk five gives you. So there's a, it's a two way street. So we're gonna simplify things to make existing software easier. But I think risk five is also starting to inform the software folks about how they may should, maybe should think a bit differently about how they build tool chains and platforms. Um, there's also architecture coherence. As all these specifications going through, I wanna really thank all the, the folks on the, the various committee chairs and the committees who helped you know, rail us in and actually make everything coherent and worry about all the interactions across, you know, this growing set of features we have. Um, but that is a, you know, that's a limit on how fast we can add new things. We have to make sure everything still works correctly. Um, and part of what we'll be doing going forward is really prioritizing those features on the ISA roadmap. So we've been a bit more reactive to requests from folks coming in. I think now as an organization at RISC-V International, we'll be more proactive about putting out an ISA roadmap and planning which things we add in over time, right? So that's how we're gonna hopefully help manage the success we're having. So a few other things, you know, people talk about RISC-V, they see this growth, they see all these different cores, they see all these extensions, and one of the worries is this is too incoherent, there's gonna be fragmentation, things will fall apart, everybody will do their own thing. Um, I think people do get confused here, and that's why I like to always repeat this slide, which is about the difference between fragmentation and diversity. So fragmentation is a bad thing. So fragmentation is when you do the same thing two different ways for no good reason. So, you know, classic example, humanity somehow managed to figure out that cars can either drive on the left or on the right. And so car manufacturers now have to provide left-hand drive, right-hand drive cars. There's no advantage to driving on one or other side of the road but we have to support both ways of doing it now, and that's, that's an unneeded cost in, to society, right? Diversity, on the other hand, is you have a different problem to solve. So if you wanna get across town, um, just me and some shopping, a couple miles, a bicycle is a great way to do it. If I need to carry 5,000 people, or sorry, 500 people over an ocean, a jetliner is the kind of thing you need, right? So these are different uh, applications, different problems, and that's diversity. You want a system that can support building processes for many different kinds of application workloads. But diversity is a good thing. It means you're solving different problems. It's okay if the solutions look different because the problems are different, okay? So getting back to fragmentation, how have we been avoiding fragmentation? Um, well, there's two powerful forces people often forget about. Um, one is users. So no, users are sensitive to what happened with vendor lock-in. They don't want to repeat the vendor lock-in. So they want the companies to supply them with standard, standard things. The second one is software. Software is the most expensive part of any system. And really, if you build, go your own way and fragment, you're gonna be supporting that whole software stack. And that really is, you're losing the crown jewel risk five in that case. So the big um, force that helps avoid fragmentation is nobody wants to maintain their own software stack. Now, the other thing we've been seeing is, um, as we fill in the gaps in the ISA, it also reduces the motivation for fragmentation. Now, people often ascribe some evil intent to fragmentation, but sometimes what's happening is a feature is not there and somebody's trying to ship a product and they have to figure out how to support this feature and they'll do their own thing just to get to market. 
But as we've been filling in the ISA gaps, that'll reduce the motivation for this kind of fragmentation. And so one thing we're doing in prioritizing extensions is those things that would otherwise lead to fragmentation. Focus on the things that people really care about and need to get done. That's a good thing anyway. Those are the high priority items. Focus on those as we fill in those gaps and have standards there, there's less need to fragment the community. Um, so this, this 2021, we closed a lot of gaps. And there's a bunch of other features coming along, which are you know, things like advanced interrupt architecture, the IOMMU. These things are gonna fill in big holes that will avoid the need to, to fragment the software base. So managing diversity. So it always been a plus about RISC-V that you had this huge variety of base and extensions you could combine in many ways to support different application needs, but that leads to this massive combinatorial space of options. That's not going away, but I think a lot of the community want a much smaller space to worry about. And so we're, we're developing these ISA profiles and the idea there is put the common combinations together. And so you really only have to think about this set of things all, will either all be there or not. And that's all you have to worry about rather than every arbitrary combination. Um, so we're packaging these up into three domains initially. There's a very basic set we just call RVI, which is I can kind of run some code compiled for RISC V. Then we have a microcontroller, an application processor. And the profiles, to be clear, these are only about the ISA, about instructions. And they're just saying, what are the instructions we expect to exist? And so for things like the compiler and tool chains, this is informing them on how to build that infrastructure out and what they should be focusing on supporting or prioritizing their support for in these profiles. And each domain then can focus on the combinations it really cares about rather than having to worry about every new extension that maybe is not applicable to this domain, having to support that in some way in a software ecosystem, right? So building the profiles that match each domain's needs. And finally, the platform stands. The platforms are a much bigger deal. They include not only instruction set, but details about the hardware, like memory map, controllers, reset, boot, how all those things happen. So there's a group working hard on uh, bringing those out with an initial focus on building a rich OS platform that can be standardized. So for example, a standard distro can run on any, any vendor who meets this platform standard. We view that as very important. But the key thing here is we don't stop people from doing the arbitrary specialization experimentation. That's valuable still, but you're not forcing everybody to have to buy into that full flexibility if it's not important for their domain. So a sort of closing few slides here. I just want to talk about the other part about RISC V. Now, I've used this slide many times to talk about how there's so many ISAs on SOCs these days. You know, as well as the application processor, you have graphics, image, radio, audio, security, power management. And sometimes there's over a dozen different ISAs on an SOC. And the reason that has been true is um, the apps processor, you might think, why not just use that everywhere? Well, it's, it's usually too big. It's too inflexible. It's not really designed for all these other use cases. You don't want to really put it everywhere. Another thing is a business model again. If the IP you buy in comes from some other company, that company is not allowed to use the proprietary ISA in their IP block that they sell. And so they're forced to do their own ISA for something that's programmable. That means there's another software stack which may not be that great quality that you have to deal with in your SOC. And finally, of course, engineers like to build their own ISA and that's just generally a bad idea. Um, don't let them do that. Um, so I just want to look forward a bit into what RISC V might enable. Um, so looking at SOCs and how they're developed, you know, software is one of the biggest costs in a complex SOC. When you have dozens or hundreds of cores, heterogeneous cores, you know, doing all the work for a given product domain. Um, it's always been a vision for RISC V. We can somehow switch to using RISC V for all the cores on an SOC, reduce development cost, reduce training cost. Um, and instead of having a lot of separate proprietary tool chains of middling quality, if all the effort was kind of aggregated together to make a better tool chain for everything, that's kind of one of the visions we've always had for RISC V. Um, but I think there's more than this. It's just what, what happens in these future SLC designs? Forget about RISC V. Just look at what people are building. An incredible advances in scaling. We're going to have thousands of cores on an SLC of various kinds. And how do you manage all that? What's the runtime look like? You know, I, I just... Happy to go to the 30th celebration of Linux, and that's great. But is that the future as well? Could be, you know. But how are we going to manage runtimes? What's this OS level look like on these SOCs? How are we going to compute securely? That's a big uh, growing problem. How is that going to happen? What's the runtime look like? So there's a lot of software challenges. If you look at future SOCs, how big they are, what they look like, all the concerns they have. And, you know, how can, thinking about RISC V future needs, looking ahead, how is it going to support these uh, future SOC software needs? So I just want to end here on, um, so thinking ahead, risk five in the next five years. 
Um, so really, I think 2021 is where we're sort of stopping playing catch up and in the next five years, we're gonna be start leading industry. We're gonna be defining what happens. Um, I think it's a new universal open standard. I think this can really drive innovation in how we build chips, right? And one thing I like to go back and look at is all the major ISAs had some place in history. They kind of fit in some era. So you know, IBM 360 introduced the idea of an ISA and it was in that era when first we had transistors and reliable core memory so we could build commercial computers, right? That's 360 was the winner in that domain, in that era. X86 really won the microprocessor wars. IBM accidentally left it as an open standard. Clone makers could come in and that led to X86 proliferating everywhere and becoming the, the standard in the microprocessor era when we could build computers on a single integrated circuit. ARM had a great idea in the business model of core IP. Instead of doing your own processor design, we'll sell you IP, you integrate in your SOC. So they're really being the winners in the soft core era. And so think about RISC-V is really defining what's gonna be next. Next, next. I don't have a name for this era yet. We're still seeing how this unfolds. But I view RISC-V as a winner in the next era of chip design. Okay, that's it, thanks.